All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started because we only have an hour. So hi everyone, before we start today, I want to acknowledge with respect the indigenous peoples and communities whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day and on whose traditional territories our work takes place. My name is Autumn Sipis. I'm the marketing and outreach coordinator with the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare. And on behalf of the coalition, I would like to welcome you to our webinar benchmarking for sustainable future in long-term care homes and retirement homes. Throughout the webinar, please use the chat function for any technical issues you may be experiencing. Use the Q&A function for any questions you have regarding the presentation. And our panelists will be answering questions at the end of our webinar today. We will also be recording this webinar, which will be sent out to all registrants and will be available on our website and YouTube channel at a later time. I will now hand things off to the coalition's executive director, Miles Sargent, to give us a brief introduction. Thank you, Autumn, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Canadian Coalition for Green Healthcare's culminating webinar on our new long-term care and retirement home environmental scorecard. The new scorecard builds on our long-running and successful Green Hospital scorecard, which we have been offering free of charge to Canadian hospitals for the past decade. Through collaboration with long-term care and retirement home partners and with funding support from Ontario's independent electricity system operator, IESO, we are very proud of what we have created, a new comprehensive made in Canada environmental benchmarking tool designed specifically for the long-term care sector. This new tool, will help long-term care and retirement homes identify, measure, and report on their environmental performance, helping enable sector-wide benchmarking of energy use, water use, and waste management, pollution prevention, corporate leadership, food, transportation, and climate change that can be used by senior leaders to improve decision-making to advance sustainability and environmental performance. With this scorecard, we continue the coalition's focus on helping Canada's healthcare organizations measure their environmental performance and raise awareness of both challenges and opportunities on the road to a sustainable Canadian health system. Ultimately, it will provide stakeholders with important information and insights about environmental concerns and enable individual facilities to pursue funding support programs like the IESO's Save on Energy program. Thank you to everyone who's collaborated with us on this project and to the many people in long-term care and retirement homes who provided data to allow us to beta test the software. So I will now turn the podium over to our speakers and give a quick introduction. There are several, so I will uh, introduce them quickly. First, I want to uh, mention that JJ Knott was the energy expert for the Canadian Coalition's Energy uh, Project, and he is now retired. Uh, the current team includes Kent, Autumn, Abdul, Linda, and Sean. Sean is our senior software engineer. Linda is our senior advisor for climate change. Autumn is our marketing and communications lead, and Abdul is our junior software engineer. And I think Linda is up next. Thanks, Miles. Go ahead, Linda. Yeah. Thank you, and welcome everyone. So we'll get uh, right started right away with our presentation. Um, just wanted to present to you uh, the outline of our presentation, the impetus for this project, the background, methodology, our pilot project results, uh, a short demonstration of our scorecard software, examples of other initiatives to reduce energy use in long-term care homes and retirement homes, and concluding thoughts. So let's start with the impetus for this project. Uh, the IESO delivers um, a number of services across the electricity sector in Ontario, including managing the power in real time and planning for the province's future energy needs and enabling conservation and designing a more efficient electricity market support, uh, marketplace to support the sector. So, the ISO was interested in learning more about the long-term care homes and retirement homes and their contribution to electricity demand. So we, we um, developed the sustainability benchmarking tool with a focus on the electricity demand. And we thank the ISO for funding this project. 
we have a number of other impetuses that came along the way. And as we all know, we lived through the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And with that pandemic brought some changes to the long-term care homes in Ontario, first being the requirement of air conditioning in re residence rooms, an increase in ex air exchange rates, and elimination of three and four bedroom wards. The other major thing that's happening is Canada's portion of the senior population is growing. We're, we're heading into the baby boomers and now the number of people that are aged 85 is continuing to grow significantly. With that, accommodations will be needed for the seniors as they age, uh, appropriate to their health needs. But there is a kind of a continuum of care. Um, and I think one of the objectives was to get people out of hospital if they didn't need to, but the continuing care, care that I'm referring to is starting off with home care, perhaps going to retirement home, and then a long-term care home, and then palliative care with hospital visits in between, no doubt. But the, um, the second uh, chart that I'm showing on this slide shows that there is this kind of continuum of care already with people going from uh, residences for seniors, such as retirement homes, and then ending up in nursing homes as they age. With the, with the higher age groups being more in the nursing homes. And we see from the top graph that indeed, the population of 85 and older is, is increasing and will be increasing for the next several years. By 2028, the Ontario government has committed uh, $6.4 billion to build 31,705 new long-term beds, and 28,648 upgraded long-term um, care health um, home beds. So there is some major construction happening in this sector in Ontario. We also have climate change. The reality that the day and nighttime temperatures are, are increasing and an additional need for cooling. We also have the potential for extreme weather, including the duration and intensity of these extreme weathers, the potential for power outages, forest fires and smoke, of course, seeing that from the east to the west coast, and municipalities are invoking net zero building requirements. We also have technology advances. Um, heat pumps are working at better, uh, better now at colder temperatures, and they're also being applied to traditionally natural gas areas, including domestic hot water. Solar voltaics are cheaper and more efficient, and there's also um, an idea with the modular pre-built homes, which can have high energy efficiency status, but allow for movable walls to accommodate the changing needs. Mm -hmm. And as we go through our aging population, there will be a uh, changing needs. So this could be um, an additional interest to the sector. Long-term care home and retirement home energy data has not been traditionally easily available. Uh, on the long-term care home side, only the municipal long-term care homes have energy use reported through the Ontario's broader public sector reporting requirements. And for the retirement homes, there is no reporting on energy use. So we, we thought that, okay, maybe there's another way to start um, uh, looking at how we get this data. The definitions for long-term care homes is, is not um, carved in stone nationally, but I brought forth um, three different definitions um, that are relevant to this discussion. Advantage is the not-for-profit um, uh, long-term care home sector, and they have a, a brief um, introduction that these are funded and regulated by the government when people uh, are moving there who are no longer sufficiently able to support themselves living in an independent environment. Health Canada refers to people who require on-site delivery of 24 hours, seven days a week, um, professional health services. And the Energy Star Portfolio Manager uh, definition includes the nursing homes, but also includes other residential care facilities needing nursing care, such as um, developmental handicapped and, and mental health and substance abuse facilities. On the retirement home side, ORCA, which is the Ontario Retirement Community Association, um, indicates that these are privately owned residents that provide rental accommodation and services for seniors who can live independently with minimal to moderate support. And the Retirement Homes Act requires that 
Um, there are a number of, of options that retirement homes can provide, and they're, they're supposed to offer at least two of them, and including programs like dementia care, assistance with bathing, um, administering medicine, and that kind of thing. So let's look at some of the um, background information here. First uh, slide I'd like to show you is um, the facilities and beds in Ontario currently uh, under the type of care home that we have. And, and the dates uh, vary uh, that I'm reporting here, uh, which indicates uh, lack of access to some of this information. But in 2021, long-term care homes in Ontario had 627 facilities and 76,000 plus beds. Of interest here is that 300 of these facilities are older and need to be developed. That means more than 30,000 beds have to be upgraded. And there was an additional note that I provided earlier that over 30,000 new, be new beds are to be built, meaning new facilities in many cases. On the retirement home side, there's nearly, um, in 2023, the um, ORCA reports that there's nearly 780 facilities with an excess of 70,000 beds, making it almost similar in, in terms of size to the long-term care home side. Under palliative care, and I'm reporting this here because I'm thinking about the continuum of care that I um, offered you earlier, in 2014, the data showed us that there was 36 in Ontario with about 260 beds. Hopefully that number has risen, but that's what we have now. And just for comparison's sakes, um, Ontario's hospitals have 140 um, facility corporations listed at 217 sites with over 33,300 beds. And so where uh, we have the information for 2021, that number um, could be changed due to a lot of things that have happened since then. In terms of a floor space comparison, hospitals between hospitals and long-term care homes, more than double the uh, um, space is uh, dedicated to long-term care homes. Energy and electricity consumption, I'm showing this for 2014 data, both for senior living and um, hospitals, where the senior living is the, um, the name that um, was used in the survey that was undertaken in this particular year to identify long-term care homes. And the share of electricity consumption, which is the important information I wanted to share here, is that it's similar. Um, it was similar in 2014, not, not far apart for between hospitals and long-term care homes. And in terms of more information on energy consumption, um, an estimate for Ontario is that long-term care homes consume about 3% of natural gas and about 4% of electricity in Ontario. For hospitals, it's about 7% for natural gas and 3% for electricity. If you add these two together, the healthcare component, long-term care plus hospitals, consumes about 10% of the natural gas in Ontario and about 7% of the electricity consumed in Ontario. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, a further reference from uh, a survey taken by StatsCan showed that the um, uh, long-term care home sector had an energy use intensity of about 1.43 gigajoules per meter squared. And other um, more newer information coming from the Energy Star Portfolio Manager, long-term care homes um, having a, a median uh, energy use intensity of 1.1. And they also report um, medium source uh, energy use intensity, which is um, correspondingly higher. And for hospitals, it's about 2.4 for the median site EUIs, which is more than double. And so just putting that in perspective. We have a number of senior homes registered with the Energy Star Portfolio Manager Program. About half of the old sites for uh, long-term care homes or senior homes are in Ontario. There are eight senior homes that are certified uh, in Ontario. And there is one uh, more recently certified multifamily high-rise senior community. The energy distribution, uh, which Energy Star Portfolio Manager shows in their uh, information from December 2020, indicates that the most efficient hospitals have uh, an average EUI, and this is all in source, um, of uh, 0.91 gigajoules. 
their median or their percentile, 50th percentile is about 1.63. And the ones that are performing the worst are, are worse or harder time reaching the higher goals, 2.74 gigajoules per meter squared. And in terms of the fuel use breakdown, mostly natural gas uh, from Energy Star Portfolio Manager uh, and, um, and, and quite a bit of electricity as well with the others minor. So I'll, I'll brief you uh, a little bit on about the methodology. In phase one, uh, we developed the questionnaire uh, that was based on our uh, Green Hospital scorecard, and we converted the relevant questions to have a more of a long-term care home and retirement home focus. We had sector representatives review the questionnaire, which we're very grateful for. Um, and then we developed the software architecture for this online survey tool. In phase two, uh, we converted the questionnaire to the online survey tool. Um, we undertook pilots with sector representatives to, to trial this um, final version that we had. And we finalized the online tool and identified best practices for electricity reduction and um, further developing an article for the, um, promoting what we've done and this webinar. And uh, Miles also mentioned the categories of this questionnaire, but I'll do that briefly here as well. Under energy, we have energy usage, energy sources, energy using equipment, renewable energy, and energy behavior. Water, we have water usage, water using equipment. For waste, we have waste quantities, reduction reuse, composting and recycling opportunities. Leadership, including policy and setting targets pollution prevention, including toxics reduction, transportation, um, including active and electric, uh, food, which refers to the menus and um, the type of service, and climate change, um, identifying what types of extreme weather events have happened and the impacts of these, and um, um, in, uh, opportunities for adaptation and resilience. And now I'm going to turn it over to Autumn, who's going to share with you the pilot results. Hey, <clears throat> thank you, Linda. Just give me one sec to situate myself here. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so thank you again, Linda. Uh, for this project, my part was that I worked with our long-term care home and retirement home participants to set them up with the survey and guide them through it. I have since been doing some data analysis, um, the results of which, which I will share with you now. Um, so to start, let's look at a breakdown of our participating sites, starting with site type or peer group. As you can see, we were pretty lucky to have a diverse group of participants for such a small pilot. We had six long-term care homes, one long-term care and palliative care home, or palliative care home, three long-term cares that were associated with a hospital and two mixed sites, which we defined as being both long-term care and retirement homes. And so this brought us to a total of 12 participants. Um, in the right-handed chart, you can see these numbers broken down as a percentage of the total participation. Another way we can break down the participation is by ownership type. So two of the sites were private, four were municipal, five were not-for-profit, and one was charitable. And again, on the right-hand chart, you can see how these numbers look as a percentage of the total participation. So these graphs show the most common room types that were reported by the participating sites. The majority as shown on the left-handed graph was private individual rooms or suites with one bedroom. In the right-handed graph, you can see multiple sites also reported having a number of semi-private rooms, which are two separate bedrooms with a shared bathroom. Um, one site even had between 201 and 250 semi-private rooms. We also had 58% of participating sites that reported having rooms with two beds. Um, and one site even reported having between 51 and 100 two-bedroom rooms or two-bed 
room, sorry, um, which you can see on the graph on the left hand side. Um, no sites actually reported having rooms with three or four beds. So on to energy use. In the chart on the right, you can see energy use displayed as energy type by percentage of total energy use. The total energy use for all sites encompassing all energy types was 99,642.93 gigajoules. Of this total energy use, 84% was electricity and 14% was natural gas. A very small percentage was propane and fuel oil, and no participants reported using district heat, district cooling, or exported energy. I also wanted to mention that for individual sites, <clears throat> the natural gas usage did range anywhere from 12 to 35%, creating that 14% average. Another way we can look at this energy use data um, is by average, average energy use by type. So the total average energy use was 12,455.37 gigajoules. And as you can see again, electricity is a very large portion of that average. So on to energy use intensity. Energy use intensity is the total energy use in gigajoules divided by the total area in square meters. The total average EUI was found to be 0.73, with the highest reported EUI being 1.37 and the lowest being 0.25. So if we think back to Linda's slide on sector energy consumptions and the median EUI reported by Energy Star, which was 1.1, our findings are really not too far off. While our average of 0.73 is lower, we do have to keep in mind our very small sample size and the potential for bias as well, since a lot of our connections when we're reaching out to long-term care and retirement homes have typically been with facilities that already have a special interest in energy conservation and efficiency. So they may already be thinking about things, working towards these things, um, as we'll see in some more data I'm gonna to present to you guys. So for heating and cooling, on the left side of the chart, you can um, details the most common heating sources used by facility. And on the right-hand side, you can see a chart detailing the most common AC sources used by facilities. So from these charts, we can, charts, we can see the most common heating source reported by facilities was hot water boilers with over 92% of persistent participants reporting their use. As for AC, the most common source was reported was central chillers with 75% of participants reporting their use. For both heating and cooling, the second more, most common source was roof mounted HVAC. So if we're looking at um, portable heating and cooling units, you can see the percentage of residents using portable heating units on the left side and portable AC units on the right side. The majority of participants reported that 0% of their residents use portable heating units, with only one participant reporting that between 1 and 10% of their residents use portable heating units. The similar case is true for portable AC, where the majority reported that 0% use portable heating units, but there was more variability in the responses with one participant reporting between 11 and 20% of their residents use portable AC, and another reporting that between 41 and 50% of their residents use portable AC units. So now if we look at what percent of residents' rooms have air conditioning in them, which you can see on the chart on the right side, we can see that the majority of sites reported that 100% of their resident rooms have AC, and only two sites reported having no AC in resident rooms. So those that reported they have no AC in resident rooms does correspond with those that reported resident use of portable AC units. So 
Basically, this chart shows the amount of sites which have applied the indoor air ventilation and filtration guidelines to reduce aerosol transmissions of COVID-19. As you can see, the answer was yes for all participants, except for one who did not answer the question. So if we're talking in terms of amenities, all sites reported having full and functional in-house kitchen services and functional in-house laundry services. And then so energy conservation and efficiency, this chart displays the different energy conservation and efficiency practices being undertaken at facilities. The majority of sites reported using more than one method of energy conservation. And the most common practice reported was turning off the lights when room or, rooms are unoccupied with 100% of responding sites reporting this activity. Just a quick note, we had no response from two participants regarding this question. So you may see, you know, where it says turning the lights off, it's 10, but that was 100% of those who responded to that question. And then, um, so the LED lighting technology was also, was also reported to be in majority of responding sites with 90% using LEDs for exit lighting and 80% deploying LEDs for both interior and exit lighting. And then if we're looking at water conservation and efficiency, we really wanted to highlight here those that influence hot water and therefore electricity use. So 90% of sites that responded to this question reported using the high efficiency Energy Star washing machines, 60% reported using the high efficiency Energy Star dishwashers. However, only one participant claimed to use high efficiency ice machines and only 50% of respondents reported using high efficiency shower heads and high efficiency faucets. All right, so when it comes to corporate commitment around energy conservation, we asked respondents whether their organization's corporate commitment to environmental performance included policies on energy conservation. The result, as you can see from the chart, was very 50-50, so 50% did have those policies um, on energy conservation. And as you can see on the left, only 40% of those policies have clearly defined targets for energy conservation with the same participants reporting having an action plan for how those targets will be achieved, which you can see on the right side. When it comes to corporate commitment to green initiatives, we found that 50% of respondents had at least some form of commitment to green initiatives with around 30% having green teams, 40% having someone assigned to green initiatives and so on. All right, so for the transportation section, you can see on the left-handed chart that only 33% of respondents have policies to address active and clean transportation but over 50% have a program to promote alternative transportation to replace single occupancy vehicles, which you can see on the right-handed chart. And so for electric vehicle charging stations, only 22% reported they are actually present at their facilities. And then you can see here on the left-handed graph that the majority of participants do not have preferred parking for low emission and electric vehicles. But on the left-handed graphs, we see that despite 44% of our participants having no fleet, 11% of respondents did report to have a low emission vehicle in their long-term care or retirement home fleet. Oops. <clears throat> So for the climate change section, we found that 50% of respondents reported that climate change has been recognized by management at their facility in some way. So this recognition could include having someone assigned some climate change responsibility, acknowledgement in the facility's strategic plan, reports to the board of direct directors, and or climate change being recognized in specific policies. Okay, so finally here, are some of the reported best practices that we got from participants. Um, we had over 25% of respondents reporting to have done energy audits and assessments. A few sites mentioned the use of heat recovery practices, including the use of heat pumps. 
One site in particular detailed the use of weight heat recovery from the kitchen, laundry, and boiler room, which is used to preheat domestic hot water while the external heat pump extracts energy from outside the building to assist in the heating and cooling of their new energy recovery ventilus ventilator system. And they claim that this migration to the new technologies really helped their site to replace the window mount air conditioning units and decrease heating oil consumption by 30%, which is really great. Multiple sites also claim to be looking into adding solar power technologies, um, with 12% of sites already having adopted solar hot water heating. Okay, and obviously purchasing Energy Star appliances when available was a really great thing to see too. I'm now going to hand things off to Abdul, our junior software engineer, to give you all a demonstration of the scorecard software. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. Uh, my name is Abdul Moid Sakib, and I'm the software junior software engineer. And I'll be now demonstrating you the scorecard software. So this is the scorecard software's homepage. But before we get get to scorecard the administrator will be setting up your account, which will you'll receive a link to set up your password. Once you do that, you're able to log into the scorecard. So as you can see here, we have all these uh, categories. So the first step that you would do is you create your organization. So you go in the organization category, and this is where your organization will be listed. So, We'll go ahead and create an organization. So once you type your organization name, your organization will be listed right here. And the next step will be is you will be creating your sites. So in this category, you will click on the sites. And this is where your sites will be displayed. And you'll go at the top right and you create the site, create your site. So the first thing you would do is that you would select your organization that you created. So, and this is where all these information, you can put your information uh, related to your site. And, and you can see here that there's a site type which you could choose the long-term care, long care home and retirement home, sorry. And you will list out all the information here. Once you put your information of your site, your site will be created right here, as you can see here. And if you wanted to add your buildings, uh, you first select your site. And at the bottom, this is where your buildings will be listed. And then you do the same thing. You create, you put, click on the create button and you put all your information regarding your building, uh, especially with your condition floor area. And once you created your buildings and site, once you create your site, a survey would be automatically generated for you. So in order to access that survey, you would go to the surveys category. And then a survey will be generated for you. As you can see here, this is the organization that you uh, I just created with the site and the survey was automatically generated for you. And this is where you type your information you know, in your survey. So all the information will be written here. And as you can see at the right side, we have the nav navigation bar, uh, which for example, if you wanted to type something on the energy section, so you would select the under energy section, it'll take you right here and you type down every information here. Or if I wanted to write something down on the water, it will automatically take you there, as you can see here. And let's say if you wanted to save your information, uh, let's say if you're writing down your survey and you wanted to stop and you want to try it later on. Uh, in order to do that, so you could, what you can do is that at the right side, there's a save button. So once you click that, 
it will be safe. Your your uh, survey will be safe to you. It will go to the response. And once you save that, and once you fill down your survey, and once it's completed, you can go at the bottom at the submit uh, button and you click it, it will automatically be, sub your survey will be submitted. It will go to the responses. So in the responses, it will be right here in this category responses, where once you submit your survey, it will list out all your uh, surveys that you submitted. Uh, just to clarify, once you submit your uh, survey, you cannot uh, edit it, but you can contact the administrator to open it up for you if you mistake anything, if you put anything, any error data in the survey, uh, the administrator can uh, open it up for you and you can write it down again. So once you uh, submitted, you can view your, uh, you can view what you have input it. So if I select a response, it will display you all these uh, sections. If I want to see any information regarding the energy, it will, when you click it, it will list out all the energy uh, information for you. So once all that's submitted, you can go ahead and access to your dashboard in the uh, dashboard category. Once you click on that, it will take you to the homepage where you can select the organization that you created and then you select your site, which will list then uh, display your dashboard. For instance, as you can see here, there is the energy usage and you can use the energy use intensity to compare your data to your peer group's average or everybody's average. And this is the end of my demonstration for a software scorecard. And I'll be taking over from here. And I just need to advance from Autumn's slides. OK, um, thank you, Abdul, for showing us the, uh, the software program. I'm going to uh, go over some examples of initiatives to reduce energy use in long-term care homes and retirement homes that were not part of the scorecard, but what we uncovered as we were uh, working on this project. So in terms of um, Energy Star's portfolio manager program, I mentioned that there was eight certified long-term care homes in Ontario. Uh, these were all done by the same uh, home, Sunrise Homes. Uh, they had also, I think, hundreds of homes in the US that were also certified as well. And in their report, um, or in their on their website, they report mm -hmm. that of the best practices that got us, uh, got them to this, um, Energy Star certification, they listed these. So efficiency in kitchen and laundry operations, lighting, HVAC and refrigeration, comprehensive maintenance program to maintain equipment and conserve energy costs, and team members implementing energy efficient best practices in their daily routine to further conserve costs and energy consumption. And they also indicate that this is something that they could also do at home, which was uh, interesting. So they have kind of a um, a, a high level um, indication that programs have to be in place for, for um, maintenance uh, program, maintenance, as well as a conscious effort by the team members to also undertake energy consumption, which is energy reduction, which is basically energy behavior. Uh, we also found that um, a number of passive house standards have been adopted around the world for long-term care homes. And this is interesting because it's um, it it has been happening, mm, maybe not quite a decade, but uh, for several years, and has now just started to grow uh, much more quickly. And there's also a trend towards electrification, uh, away from fossil fuels to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, an example of moving away uh, from fossil fuels is the municipal net zero building codes for new builds. There's a number of municipalities who are looking at this across Ontario. Um, City of Toronto has probably the most developed and, and talked about uh, program in place, and they've recently led a contract 
to build the first net zero long-term care home in Toronto, Carefree Lodge, um, which is a facility of 360 beds, which will replace the existing 127 bed uh, facility on the property. It will incorporate an EMS satellite post. Um, it includes a robust response to infection prevention and control, and also um, aligns with the new and emerging best practices in elder care design is targeted for occupancy in 2026. So this will meet the City of Toronto's standard version um, four, green, green standard version four. And it really is, will set a precedent for responsible and sustainable health care development. So this, it'll be exciting to see this, um, this move forward. We also have a really interesting program from the CMHC, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. They offer the Multi-Unit Mortgage Loan Insurance, MLI Select Program for retirement homes. So this really is um, offers a reduction in um, more rate mortgage loans for new and renovated retirement homes based on energy efficiency level. Uh, so the owner or the borrower, borrower has to commit to achieving a certain efficiency level, and then they have to confirm it, confirm the achievement. Um, they also have to have um, supporting documentation completed by a qualified professional with analysis conducted using an appropriate energy simulation software. So what is it that we are looking at here in terms of energy consumption and greenhouse gas reduction reporting for new builds? Um, there's three levels of reduction um, over the base case. Uh, and so that would be 20, 25, and 40% reduction. And for existing property rep retrofits, the, le the three levels would be 15, 25, and 40% over the existing home. We have some really interesting information from uh, one of our sustainability champions, that's Pension uh, Limited who actually do this kind of um, professional evaluation for retirement homes. And uh, when I asked um, what kind of incentives uh, is um, the green building sector offered for the re residential care homes? Uh, for example, I was provided a level two achievement, which is a 25% reduction over baseline. The premiums are reduced significantly. So for example, on a loan of about $30 million, uh, the premium is reduced by about $1.3 million. If that same program opts for a level three reduction, which is a 40% reduction over baseline, we also have um, uh, an, an increase of the maximum loan that can be provided and uh, debt service coverage changes, which means about 10% more loan proceeds. The premium is reduced, and so um, the loan can be increased by $3 million, and the in there's an increase in cash flow. And so these are all the subsequent benefits to actually participating in the program and getting your mortgage through this, this program. The best practices, which uh, Pynchon had identified, included under new construction uh, for um, more insulation and, and better windows to reduce the burden on the mechanical system, in-suite or central ventilation heat recovery, high efficiency gas-fired equipment, heat pumps, and high efficiency HRVs. On existing buildings, so these are buildings built in the last five years at least, premium high efficiency heat pumps were still deemed uh, appropriate, air source heat pumps for heating or domestic hot water, and using the existing gas-fired equipment as a backup or second stage. For existing buildings that are older than five years, uh, that would include a building envelope upgrade, LED lights, uh, replace mid-efficiency boilers, and make up air with high-efficiency units or dual-fuel heat pumps uh, with heat recovery. And we actually got a table from them that showed data uh, from three buildings that they did in different areas across Ontario. And I think the, um, the important information here is that uh, two of the buildings, building one and three, opted for a level three, so that's 40, over 40% 40 reduction. And the second building was a newer building and had a little bit more difficulty in reaching the 40%, so they got a level two uh, status. And showing at the bottom the total energy savings uh, for the proposed buildings 
uh, 42 percent, 30, almost 33, and almost 44 percent reductions. And similarly, the greenhouse gas emission reductions are uh, close to 60 percent uh, in, in, in all cases. So really astounding kind of um, opportunities here. And I thank Pynchon for sharing that data with us. Um, the other interesting one that I wanted to share with you is from BC. Uh, on the, the long-term care homes that they've been working on there. The Greenhouse Gas Emission Reduction Project is an initiative where they're targeting 80% greenhouse gas reduction by 2024 at six healthcare sites. Um, there are, for the long-term care homes that they're working with, there are two sites, the Brock Farney and the Langara, and there's, there was no AC at these two sites. So they implemented a project in 2021, which um, really focused on a heat recovery chiller system. This was a, a new uh, system design, uh, designed by those uh, technology companies, Thermal Gradient Header Technology by Impact Engineering, Integral Group, and Thermonex. And it shows a significant reduction starting in January of the implementation year, as you can see the line in gray for 2022 from their past performances. So this particular technology extracts waste heat from the facilities that would otherwise be lost and uses it to heat the buildings and also produce domestic hot water. Providence Healthcare's Brock Farney won the Best in Country Award from the International Federation of Healthcare Engineering in 2022, uh, reporting a 43% energy reduction. We also find um, energy reduction opportunities included in their in the ESG reporting from uh, corporate sector. Uh, there were limited ESG reporting that we found uh, in our research, and these were primarily from the larger private separate, separate corporate organizations. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is something that's happening out of Manitoba. Um, the Red River College is building efficiency technologies access center um, is undertaking a project which considers resident and staff wellness as part of performance evaluation tools. So they'll develop and pilot better tools uh, to advance the knowledge and application of performance evaluation in long term care homes. And this is primarily to enhance the health and wellness of the residents and staff, because it's, that's a gap that we have, have actually seen. So application of these tools will enable the government, private and public sector, long-term care organizations, as well as the building industry make better evidence-based decisions about how to improve building operation and maintenance practices and target their investments um, and in terms of the retrofit and renovation strategies. And um, the Red River College folks are, are piloting the, um, um, the scorecard that we developed along with their, um, their tools that they're developing. And so we'll have some uh, better data, more data on other sites uh, using this tool in, uh, in Manitoba. And just in terms of concluding thoughts before we go to our questions, um, I, I'm showing here a graph on the right-hand side, which is the um, IESO's achieve, coming from the IESO's Achievable Potential Study in 2019, uh, where they're predicting what the electricity and natural gas increases would be from 2018 to 2028 to 2038. And I think when this report was done, there was, was not the indication that long-term care bed homes would be increasing by 50% by 2028. Uh, retrofitting of 50% of the long-term ca care beds by 2028 uh, was probably not on the books. Um, additional, and in addition to those required by 2028, there will be new beds required for the aging population beyond that, because the population growth will continue beyond that uh, for the aging population. And included in that, um, uh, New information was, it was the fact that uh, AC needs to be in individual resident rooms and no more three and four bed wards, which means that the buildings actually have to be larger, unless there's some unique designs here. Um, electricity replacing uh, some of the traditional uh, natural gas uses like domestic hot water and heating. And we will and have been seeing a rapid building of long-term care homes. And these are likely not considering 
energy use in, in these designs, they are rapidly deploying. In fact, uh, every month I probably see a couple of new announcements of new long-term care homes or new beds being developed. So this could significantly change the energy projections from the IASO's 2019 report. As you can see where the red arrow is under electricity, there is minimal showing, minimally increase uh, showing for the long-term care homes going from 28, 2018 to 2038, whereas we're, we're seeing um, at least a 50% increase by 2028 in these beds. So um, this, as I said, this could significantly change um, the, the projections, or there could be a focus on um, near or net zero energy buildings and retrofit bits with the best practices for high energy efficiency buildings. And I think those are the kinds of things that uh, the ISO was, was looking for, the best practices which we provided. I know this um, presentation focused on electricity in, in, the, um, in the scorecard that we developed. We do have other information, um, but um, this, is, um, this, is, was, this is what was of interest to our funder. So um, thanks very much. Uh, I'd now like to uh, offer this opportunity for questions and I'll uh, stop sharing my screen. Well, thank you, Linda, and thank you to the team. And Linda, while you're still on the screen there, here's, here's a good one for you from Shelley. For survey questions, are there defined sources that we are to seek out data Example, energy use, source, hydro bills, so that we're comparing similar data. Yeah, in fact, that's what we do on the Green Hospital Scorecard as well. We give examples of where to find certain information, um, because if you're doing this for the first time and you don't have a lot of resources, which we know is the case with long-term care homes and retirement homes. It's not like a hospital. You don't have millions of people, not millions. You don't have a big, a significant team working on this. So yes, uh, providing the sources of information is what we do. Okay. Uh, will there be a study? This is open to anybody who wants to jump in there. Maybe uh, Abdul, if he's not on screen, can everyone be ready here? Will there be a study in the future about the carbon footprint of food that is served at the facilities to address a major cause of climate crisis, animal agriculture? I can, I can jump yeah, in. Yeah, sure. Go, and go ahead. Miles, yep. And then, Miles, you can follow because you've oh, got okay, okay. these too. Um, yeah, yeah. There is a program addressing food right now uh, called Nourish. And, and Nourish is focusing on planetary um, healthy diets. So a, a, a plant uh, forward diet, and we'll be looking for participants to uh, work in there, to take part in a program that they're initiating. Um, that's one thing. Um, the other thing is that there's a, there's a program called Cascades and, mm -hmm. and I'm part of that program as well. And um, the Cascades, program is a, a national initiative uh, looking to um, increase the um, climate um, readiness and mitigation strategies within the healthcare system. And they offer innovation uh, grants. And one of those grants went to a facility, an organization in BC. I'm trying to remember which one. It's on the West Coast. And they are doing um, actually that. They're working with a long-term care home to look at their diet and see how they can change the diet to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions there. So Miles, do you have anything to add there? Well, one, one um, silly point, which is that when you Google nourish, uh, you get lots of nourishes. So I always put nourish uh, cohort or innovators and that will get you to the right nurse. Yeah, if you, if you want to put the link there. Uh, yeah, Autumn, I put I the link in the that. chat. So. So, that, so that's the first thing. You've got to find the right nurse. They're an amazing group. They've been around for 10 years in Canada trying to do exactly what you're mentioning in the question there. Um, so I would definitely look at that and, and even reach out to them if you're part of a hospital to see if you can partner with them in some way. I know they're always looking for partner hospitals. That's the first thing. In terms of drilling down into the carbon footprint, we have uh, in partnership with Nourish and with some research at, at McMaster University, 
uh, submitted a CIHR grant, uh, for, you know, so hopefully we get that and we'll be able to drill down a little further. Um, someone uh, asked about our email addresses. Um, I don't know if Autumn or Caroline can. can I added them to the chat. Okay, you did already. Amazing. Okay, it's hard to keep up with you, Autumn. Um, all right, here's another one from Greg Allen. Have you collected data on peak electricity demand both summer and winter? Who's up for that one? So that would be a month by month data gathering and, and our survey collects annual data. Um, that would be more appropriate through Energy Store Portfolio Manager, which does ask for month by month data. Gosh, I kind of want to call out one of the uh, participants, but that never seems fair. Um, some of that BC data, have we not seen that that goes month by month? Some of the some of the BC data does it not show? Uh, I think I've seen some of the BC data showing uh, the month by month peaks, but maybe I'm wrong. Oh, Anyone wants to jump in? Yeah, go ahead, Linda. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. their own data gathering. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, see there's, so Alex, yes, we have monthly data. Um, yeah. And access to peak data that could potentially be be shared. So that's the answer to that one. Um, okay, I think that might be uh, all the questions unless someone wants to slip in a last question with three minutes left or any other comments that the panelists would like to make that we might've missed. Um, we have one one okay. participant that has their hand raised. Oh, okay. Sorry, I, did not I see can that. allow yeah. them to talk. I I never know because I feel like people accidentally put their hands up. But Prakash, can you put in the chat if you purposefully have your hand up, <laughs> and we'll let you talk. Okay, nothing in the chat. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, is there something on the bottom there under Alex's last question? I can't seem to open it. Autumn, is there a final question there? Alex answers two at 12.57. Is there another one down there? Yeah, it was just, uh, Alex said, yes, we have monthly data. And then yes, we have access to peak data okay, okay. that could potentially be shared. Um, Thanks, so Alex. <laughs> Cecil Hahn asks if there's any grant opportunities for greenhouse funding to promote food growing through these groups. That'd be awesome. That was something that we were actually looking at a number of years ago. The coalition did some projects with on food. And um, I think that's a terrific idea because greenhouses will guarantee your, um, your resistance or resilience to uh, the weather changes, which we're going to see, late frosts or, or early frosts, um, changing significantly our growing time. So um, I don't know if the Ministry of Agriculture federally had, they did have some programs. I don't know if they are still in existence right now for novel approaches, but I think, you know, the more we talk about these things, um, and say that this is something that we're interested in, perhaps the government will listen. Um, so it is uh, one o'clock in Ontario, at least. Um, there's a nice question here, which be a nice way to summarize uh, the webinar today from Alex. Um, Alinda, you might be in a good position to answer this. Can you recap some of the reasons why we should complete the survey? Does it build, help build more information? It does help build more information. And I think what we've seen from the Green Hospital Scorecard at any rate is that people do use this to um, help them identify where they're at and where they wanna go. And so if the objective of the organization, and this is clearly related to objectives of organizations, is to reduce your energy use, reduce your energy costs, reduce your impact on the environment in other ways as well, then at least it, it puts you in a position where you can see where you compare to other organizations and it gives you ideas as well to move forward. So yeah, I think benchmarking has been proven as a tool to um, help uh, people monitor. I mean, you can't 
you can't um, change what you don't monitor, right? So I think that's really what we're what we're talking about here. Yeah, and I think just to build off what Linda said, um, I think the survey itself is a resource guide. Whether you're a hospital that is well seasoned and you know trying to be greener and more sustainable, or if you're just starting out, we think the survey is a really really great tool to show you. These are the opportunities that are out there. These are the things you can do to reduce your energy consumption, to um, you know, better your facility as a whole. And I mean, it's got the links. We have the links to the portfolio, Energy Star Manager, all those things. Um, yeah, as well as giving you a backdrop to compare yourself to yourself over previous years and to your peers, I think is always a really good um, thing to have. Um, Ken Paradise asked a question. I don't want to uh, leave him in the lurch. Uh, do you see this annual survey evolving to provide cost per square foot or meter similar to the benchmarking for hospitals? Top percentile, average maintenance, utility cost, et cetera. Ah. We haven't done that. We haven't done that in the Green Hospital Scorecard, but all these things are evolving at a time when we probably need more information like that. So if that's where the demand is, then you know we could look at that. Um, it hasn't been a demand in the past um, in the sense that, that people were happy to provide that information. So I would love to have a further conversation on that because I've always seen that as a missing link here in making good decisions. All right. Autumn, any final uh, words? No, just thank you to everyone who joined us here today. And I'll reiterate that we have this webinar recorded and I'll be sure to send it out to all our participants as well as the slides. And feel free to reach out to us if you do have any additional questions after the fact. All right. Okay, great. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, folks. Take See care. you next time. Bye, thank you. Thank you, Abdul. Thanks, Linda. Bye. Thank you.